Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical time travel through the United States and talk about some of the earliest crimes. Before we get to the crime, let's talk about the coloring. So I have selected for this week's coloring a Simon Says Stamp and Altenew collaboration set. This is the collaboration set that was released in September of 2022 for the Simon Says Stamp Stamp Timber. Um, I love Altenew's florals. I love to color them. I have selected some Copic markers to color with, and I will list those down in the description box below. I will be stamping with Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink because it is Copic or alcohol marker safe. And I am stamping this onto a piece of Nina Solar White Classic Crest 80 pound cardstock. Um, I am going to be coloring a lily that is um, transitions from orange to purple and back again. Um, it's kind of my one of my favorites, which is why I have such a wide variety of colors in my hand there. I have um, at least four, maybe five colors on each petal. I will also be doing some stippling with the markers to add those little freckles that you see in lilies. I will be taking my white gel pen to cover up any coloring outside the lines that I cannot correct with my colorless blender, as well as add the stamens back to the flowers because once I am done coloring with that dark purple, they are kind of hard to see. I will then put the stamped image back into my Misty and overstamp it with some um, Versa Fine VersaClair um, Nocturne Black ink, and then add some glitter to the petals just because glitter is pretty. And now that we've talked about the coloring, let's jump on into our crime. The 12th stop on our alphabetical crime journey lands us in the state of Idaho. Idaho was a territory of the United States from 1863 to 1890, when it was then granted statehood, becoming the 43rd state. Its nickname is the Gem State, but it is more known for potatoes. About one third of the nation's potatoes are grown in Idaho. And if you've ever eaten a real Idaho potato, you know you can taste the difference. And yes, I am speaking from experience. Um, Idaho is lesser known for being the home of the man who invented the television. There are a lot of great things about the state of Idaho, but the best is that most of my immediate family lives there. So sorry, guys, I'm kind of throwing your state under the bus this week. Our story starts somewhere in time in the mid-1860s. Mid a boy named Jackson Lee Davis was born about 1864. There is very little known about his early life, but I was able to find one record that might be his family line. Ancestry.com has a census record from the 1880 census listing Robert Davis and Elizabeth Davis as the parents of seven children, three girls and four boys, including a son named Jackson Davis. I say this may be his family because there is no middle initial or middle name listed for Jackson. However, not all of the siblings listed on the census record have them either. Some have middle initials, some do not. The Jackson on this census was listed as born about 1864 in Locustdale, Virginia. And most historical records or historians suggest that Jackson Lee Davis, a.k.a. Diamond Filled, Davis was born in the South due to the historical nature of his names. Jackson is considered by most historians as a gunslinger because he was known to wear as many as three pistols, a rifle, and a bowie knife all at the same time and at all times. Other historians have described him as a hired gun with a specific mission, to keep the sheep off the grazing land of the cattle. Whatever the truth is, and it's probably somewhere in the middle, it certainly led to a series of interesting events. By 1892, Jackson Lee Davis, here on out referred to as Jack, was working in the Black Jack Mine in the Silver City District of Owyhee County, Idaho. He left the Black Jack to follow rumors of a diamond strike in the nearby hill hills. He failed to find any diamonds, but talked so much of the diamond fields that he earned the nickname Diamond Field Jack. In 1895, after the failed prospecting attempt, the Sparks Harrell Cattle Company hired Jack to keep sheep herders from moving their flocks into cattle grazing lands. 
He was paid $50 a month to keep the sheep herders off what was considered cattle territory. The idea may have been that his reputation of carrying so many weapons all the time was really just intimidation. But there is a report that the company instructed him to, quote, keep the sheep back, don't kill, but shoot to wound if necessary. Use what measures you think best. If you have to kill, the company will stand behind you, regardless of what happens. Not surprisingly, this range war between the sheepmen and the cattlemen quickly turned ugly. After a confrontation that led to a wounding of a sheep herder named Bill Tolman, Jack was on the run. Fearing that Tolman might die from his gunshot wound and that Jack himself would be hung, he fled south into Nevada to hide. While in Nevada, he bragged about his activities and said he was paid $150 a month in Idaho to kill sheep herders. That's a lot of money in the 1890s. In January of 1896, Jack headed back to southern Idaho. He stated later on that he was headed back to turn himself in, but somehow he never quite made it to the sheriff. By February of 1896, Jack had begun working for the cattle company again, and almost immediately as he came back to work, two sheep herders were killed in the area where he was working. Jack and another cowboy from the ranch, Fred Gleason, were seen wandering along looking for horses. One evening, they rode near a sheep camp after dark, fired off a few rounds, and continued on their way toward Brown Ranch where they had been staying. After a couple of days at Brown Ranch, resting and reshoeing their horses, they decided to leave and head up river to Middlestack Ranch. They did not seem to be in a hurry to get anywhere and spent several days drinking and talking with the ranch hands at the HD Ranch and then rode with them to Wells, Nevada. Meanwhile, the bodies of two sheep herders had been found shot and killed at a sheep camp in the Shoshone Basin area of Twin Falls County, Idaho. Because he had been in the area at the time of the killings and because he often bragged about shooting up sheep herders, Diamondfield Jack was the prime suspect in the murder case, and once again he headed south, this time hoping to escape all the way to Mexico. However, while in Arizona, Jack became embroiled in a separate shooting incident and was arrested. And while sitting in a territorial prison in Arizona, he was ex extradited to Idaho, where he was put on trial for murder. Fred Gleason was found hiding in Deer Lodge, Montan Montana, and was also brought brought back to Idaho for the trial. Ooh, words are hard. True to their word, however, the owners of the Sparks Harrell Ranch put up most of the money for the defense of Jack and Fred. They were given the best defense money could buy. However, the prosecutors had a pretty good case against the men. Another cowboy from the ranch testified that they were heard drunkenly threatening to kill sheep herders. At the scene of the crime, a magazine was found in the sheep wagon with a diamond drawn in blood by one of the victims. Also, the sheep men were killed with a 44 caliber bullet shot out of a 45 caliber gun. Jack was known to have bought 44 caliber cartridges when the correct ones were not available. So it was easy to establish that the men had also been in the area on the day of the murders. Jack's fate was decided when the jury took only two hours to return a verdict of guilty. Jack was sentenced to be hanged on June 4th, 1897. Fred? Fred was acquitted. So Jack was confined to the, Ca the Cajun County Jail in Albion, Idaho, where the day of his scheduled execution date drew near. He made hair ropes and other trinkets for children who visited the jail. The next five years, however, would be a constant state of turmoil. Appeals were mounted by his attorneys, and several times his execution was stayed. On February 24, 1899, the Idaho legislature approved an act which ruled that all executions must take place at an Idaho state penitentiary. Because he was still under sentence of death, Diamondfield Jack was moved to the prison in Boise. At 1.30 in the morning on February 27, 1899, Diamondfield Jack arrived at the Boise Depot. The Warren's report for the day states that the warden, with guards, met with the party at the depot and took charge of the prisoner, who was, without delay, taken to the penitentiary where he arrived without mishap. He was placed in a new cell and watched by special guards. 
Then, on December 24th of 1899, this Idaho Supreme Court ruled that Diamondfield Jack must go back to Casha County Jail as a county prisoner, so he was taken back down to the county jail. By 1900, Diamondfield Jack had exhausted all of his appeals, and Jack's execution date was reset for July 3rd, 1901. The week before his execution date, he watched the gallows being built and tested, declaring them capable of doing the job. The day before his execution date, Jack was given a reprieve due, the, due to the confessions of two other men to the murders. James Bauer and Jeff Gray had confessed to the killings, claiming self-defense. By this time, public opinion had shifted in Jack's favor, mostly due to the confessions of James and Jeff, but also due to the easing of tension between the sheep and the cattle herders. The Board of Pardons extended the execution date to the 17th of July, much to the outrage of the state prosecutor. Three hours before Jack's scheduled execution, word arrived at the Casa County Sheriff that his sentence had been changed to life in prison. So Jack was moved back to the Idaho State Penitentiary in Boise, which is a little bit farther north, and he was and he stayed there until he was finally pardoned on December 17, 1902, by then Idaho Governor Frank W. Hunt. But that is not the end of Diamondfield Jack Davis. Oh no, no. At this point, Jack permanently relocated to Nevada. He gravitated to the Tonopah Goldfield area, where rich silver and gold deposits had been uncovered. He found work as a mine operator and a hired gun, and with a short, within a short time, had earned a small fortune. Additionally, Jack established several mining camps near Goldfield, including one called Diamond Field. As with most mining figures, Jack was constantly on the lookout for the next big strike, so he plowed much of his money into new mining ventures, most of which proved unsuccessful. By the 1920s, he had lost his fortune and had drifted south into the growing community of Las Vegas, Nevada. Not much is known about Jack's time in Las Vegas, although it is said he was a fixture at one of the small bars in the downtown area and worked as a shill or a barker for one of the downtown clubs. In 1949, he was hit and killed when a Las Vegas taxi cab backed into him. He was then buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in Las Vegas. Today, an impressive historical marker, Marker 251, devoted to Jackson Lee, Diamondfield Davis, can be found in front of the Cactus Pete's Casino in Jackpot, Nevada, which is located on the Nevada-Idaho border not too far from where he roamed as a gunman for hire for the Sparks Harrell Cattle Company. So I still have so many questions. The two cowboys who admitted, quote, I'm air quoting here, admitted to committing these killings, I couldn't find any evidence that they were ever tried. And so was that alibi created by the cattle company to, you know, to have the backs of these cowboys that they had originally promised that they would take care of as long as they were defending the cattle territory. I don't even know. But anyways, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the story. I did find some photographs, which is kind of exciting when I find the pictures. So I have a picture of Jackson Lee Diamondfield Davis. Then there's a picture of his booking photo, <laughs> which is kind of, I'm digging the mustache there a little bit. This is a picture of his headstone I found at Graves, Find a Grave. And then this is a picture of the um, historic monument number 251. So thank you so much for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. I have a couple of other videos here for you to watch, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did so. Leave me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and have a really great day. 